Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 25th of the 10th month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with the 6th of January, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are going to go back to our reading of Bereshit today. I'm going to have a chance to put together the um, the topic that we were discussing last week a little bit more cohesively, and then present that for everyone's edification. I think if we do it in an orderly fashion, it'll be better. So everyone was kind enough to allow us to do that, and we're going to go ahead and hop back on to where we left off here in the original covenant writings of our forefathers. To recap, we've been going through the story or the uh, narrative of the patriarchs here, and we are at the times of Yitzhak and Yaakov, okay? where Yitzhak in his old age is passing things on or things are moving on to his the, the times of his son and what he's going to be doing. If you keep in mind that the what the forefathers walk out is a microcosm of what would be walked out later on with their children in a larger scale, you can see the pictures that are being shown here with Abraham and his sojourning before being given the land was representative of the children and their sojourning and migrations before going in. As he went into Mitzrayim, his wife was taken, Egypt was plagued, and he came out with booty. The same thing happened to his children in a larger scale at a later time. On the very same way, Yitzhak, as the quote-unquote promised seed, never left the land, and the things that happened to him there were, were reminiscent of that era and time. And then, as we see here, in Yaakov's time, he's the one that goes outside of the land to labor for his family and possessions, to which it is only the streaked the speckled and spotted, if you will remember, that are his. Any others that had nothing to do with them. It's a type and picture, as it's explained by Kepha in the recognitions, and as it's mentioned in the Apostolic Constitutions, and by others of the renewed covenant times, that our Mashiach came mostly in the fulfillment of the foretellings shown in Moshe and Yaakov, basically coming as the one like unto Moshe in all things, and then in the manifest era of Yaakov, where he's going out to labor for his, for what's his own. You can see this parable playing out in practical form, in the narrative of the story, for example, in the shepherd of Hermas, where in his visions, he's actually met by the shepherd who has the satchel on his pack like he's going on a long journey with the bag of silver with him, just like it mentions in the book of Proverbs, if you will. So there's this theme of what's being done that you can find the allusions to in, in all these places, but the, the meat and potatoes, what you can't get away from is the narratives here and how it plays out later on. So if you keep these things in mind, ob willing, it'll make more sense as we go along. And everything's important. Yitzhak being old and having his eyes dim was this people at that particular time, not being able to see, which is exactly the conditions that happened when he came. So um, there's other things that play out, but we'll, we'll leave that to it. And we'll just get to this, the narrative. If you happen to see any of these things, and I don't mention them, you can bring them up or mention them in the chat. Think about them until you know for certain, or if you're not sure, and you just want to say, hey, well, this is what came to mind feel free to share because we're all learning. But it is the truth, and he can never be inconsistent with himself. So without further ado, this is Bereshit, or Genesis 27, verses 1 through 46. It says, And it came to be, when Yitzhak was old and his eyes were too dim to see, that he called Eth Esau, his elder son, to him, or sorry, and said to him, my son. And he answered him, Here I am. And he said, See now, I am old, 
I do not know the day of my death, and therefore take now your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt wild game for me, and make me a tasty dish such as I love, and bring it to me to eat, in order that my inner being does barak you before I die. And Ribka heard when Yitzhak spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt wild game and bring, or and to bring it. And Ribka spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, See, I heard Eth your father speak to Esau, your brother saying, Bring me wild game to make me a tasty dish to eat, and barak you in the presence of Yahuwah before my death. And now, my son, listen to my voice according to what I command at you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and make, er, and I make a tasty dish from at them for your father, such as he loves, and you shall take it to your father, and he shall eat it, so that he might barak you before his death. Now, goat is a gamey animal. It tastes like a wild animal, unlike like a deer or whatever. I don't know personally, but that's what I've heard. So you can you can fake it with them, right? But one thing that might not be so clear, we've already mentioned that Esau was a wild man or a hunter, right? And Jacob, it says, was perfect and dwelt in tents, right? But what we don't see so clearly is Esau was rem the first mighty hunter, if you recall, was Nimrod. And he was first prominent as a protector or a hunter of the people or of wild game, both of leopards domesticating and taming them that would attack men. So... There's a lot more involved in that, but to be a hunter, to be of that ilk, that's the only kind of example that they had that I'm aware of. Nimrod was the great hunter, the mighty one before our creator that was a rebel. There's more about that we can get into later, but I just wanted to point out the contrast. You can see clearly the two different types there that might not be so clear if you don't have that history behind you. And Jacob said to Re Rebekah, or Ribka, his mother, See, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am smooth-skinned, or a smooth-skinned man. What if my father touches me? Then I shall be like a deceiver in his eyes, and shall bring a curse on myself, and not a baraka. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son, only obey my voice and go, get them for me. And he went and fetched them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made a tasty dish such as his father loved. Now, I don't know if we covered it yet, but we will when we get to the book of Yobelin. She was actually enjoined by Abraham, who was studying the words that were given to him, and he knew that Yaakov was going to be the one in which the promises were, and Esau was to be rejected. And he enjoined his mother to watch out for his interests, and which is the whole reason why she did the things that she did. But you don't quite see that insider information here, if you will. It says, And Ribka took the best eth garments of her older son Esau, which were eth with her in the house, and put them on eth Yaakov, her younger son. And she put eth the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave eth the tasty dish and eth the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son, Jacob. And remember, his name means he who gets what's coming at the hill, right? Your reward is coming at the hill of what you're doing also known as a supplanter. And he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. 
Who are F you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you said to me. Rise now, sit and eat of my wild game, so that my or so that your inner being or soul might barak me. Yet Yitzhak said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought it to me. Then Yitzhak said to Yaakov, Come now, or come near now, so that I fill you, my son, if f you, this my son Esau or not. Now, that's the literal, but it's like, if you are, right, this my son Esau or not. This is literally an uh, English translation from the Hebrew. It says, And Yaakov went near to Yitzhak his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, and he baruch him. And he said, Eth you this my son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and let me eat of my son's wild game, so that my inner being might barak you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Yitzhak said to him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled eth, or he smelled the eth smell of his garments, and Baruch him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Yahuwah has Baruch, and give you the Elohim of the dew of the Shamayim, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be mighty unto your brothers, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those cursing you, and Baruch be those that Barak you. Now, this is given to Abraham. It was given to Yitzhak, if I remember, and it is now passed to Yaakov. Those specific injunctions, the cursing in Baraka, was enjoined both to this, to Louis and his children and to Yahuda specifically and his children for the monarchy and all the men that would rule over others and uh, the tribe of Yahuda generally because it, it's not something that can be repented of. His word is true and we have to follow these things along in their natural course. But you can see it here. It's generally given to Yitzhak and then Yaakov, and it would be to all that would come from him. Just something to keep in mind. When This is why he says we're not to speak evil of anyone. We don't know who is of what, and we don't want to cause ourselves problems. Right? <clears throat> it's why we're enjoined to Barak and not curse. And there, there's a whole bunch in the common scriptures irregardless of this fact that tells you not to do that but this tells you why so to continue it says and it came to be as soon as Yitzhak had finished Barak or Barakin or the Baraka right blessing Eth Yaakov and Yaakov had hardly left the presence of Yitzhak his father that Esau his brother came in from his hunting and he, too, had made a tasty dish and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father rise and eat of his son's wild game, so that your inner being might barak me. And Yitzhak, his father, said to him, Who are eth you? 
And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Yitzhak trembled exceedingly and said, Who was it then who hunted wild game and brought it to me? And I ate all of it before you came, and I have Barak him. Yes, he is Baruch. When Esau heard at the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Barak me, me too, O my father. And he said, Your brother came with deceit and took your Baraka. Now notice that he does not curse him for that. He doesn't say anything bad against him whatsoever. And this is because of the same reason Noah cursed Canaan instead of Ham for the offense that Ham had done. Because those who are Baruch cannot be cursed. You can't curse what you Barak. So when he had given a Baraka to his sons, the curse had to go to the son of his son. Just as when Adam was given the Baraka by the Almighty, it was the ground that was cursed for his sake, because he couldn't be. So something else to keep in mind. <clears throat> And Esau said, Is this why his name then is called Jacob? For he has caught me by the hill these two times. He took my eth birthright, and see, now he has taken my barak, or blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a baraka for me? Then Yitzhak answered and said to Esau, See, I have made him unto you, or sorry, see, mighty I have made him unto you, and eth all his brothers I have given to him as servants, and I have sustained him with grain and wine. And what then shall I do for you, my son? Now, a lot of people get tripped up here and they have contention because he only has one brother. But when you make the distinction, it's father, 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 or father of my father. They don't have a word for grandpa. They don't have a word for cousins. The 12 tribes were all cousins and called brothers. So um, that that's the thing that we're having to deal with. When he spoke this, you had Yitzhak, who is contemporary with Yishmael, and all the sons of Keturah, all the seed of Abraham, to which all of them had children, and they were brothers, or cousins, if you will, Akim. They were Mishpecha, another word for family, but they were in their separate tribes and clans. And this is what it means. He is to be mighty over all his brothers. Just like Yaakov tells them later on, to they were the head family of Shem, they were the head family of Seth, and they were not to be uh, under anyone when they were in right standing with their maker. But that's a separate thing for another time. This is right here, talking about his brothers or contemporaries with the family of Abraham specifically. It says, And Esau said to his father, Have you only one Baraka, my father? Barak me, me too, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And I'll, I'll tell you, my, my third eldest son, Zachary, he would cry and get very emotional at this point um, because he always thought Esau was getting the, the raw end of the deal. And when you read the natural narrative right from the Bible, right, it can seem that his brother is both a deceiver and a surplanter, where he stole his birthright, but trickery, right? And he, he stole his birth his birthright, sorry, right here by trickery. And oh, I'm sorry, he stole the covenant bar bar baraka, the blessing, if you will, by trickery right here. And then he tricked 
if you will, they say, or supplanted his brother out of his birthright for porridge. But when you look at the account in Yobelim, when you take into consideration the things that are in the foretellers concerning Edom and his character, then you can clearly see why the things would happen to him that they did. And then when you know that he is a type and shadow of the things to come in Catholicism, it, it, it lines up perfectly. It's not pleasant, but it is the truth. And Edom being the Katim can be seen in Gad the Seer. The Katim being Rome can be seen in the Peshars or the interpretations of the Dead Sea Scrolls for Nahum, Amos, and a few others. It is literally the general theme of those. You can find the fulfillment of that in Josephus' Antiquities of the Yahudim and Wars of the Yahudim, as well as foreshadowed all throughout Scripture and in Revelation. It ties all these things together. And for another uh, another witness of this again is in the Renewed Covenant where Shaul is talking about Hagar being the first covenant at Mount Sinai as a parable, meaning that her children, Yishmael, was the first covenant believers, the wild donkey man, which we've talked about before, the donkey being equated to the first covenant believers. Because without bit and bridle, they were stubborn and they refused to do it, right? He rode in on a donkey and a colt because it was after the Babylonian captivity. So th these are all points of the truth playing out. But if Esau is for the first covenant believers, right? I'm sorry, if Yishmael represents the first covenant believers and Yitzhak is the renewed covenant or the promised seed from there, then Yaakov is when they're going out to labor. Esau is the one who was up, born in the womb with him, but rose up and hated his brother in his heart and persecuted him and tried to separate the birthrights and things from them by violence. That's exactly what would happen later on. And it was foreshadowed in this man. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it says, And Yitzhak, his father answered and said to him, See, your dwelling is of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the Shamayim from above, and by your sword you are to live and serve your eth brother. And it shall be when, he, when you grow restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, here's another instance of a yoke being used as authority. It's that word in Hebrew is um, El, like Al. When you say El Alion, that is El as in Mighty One, Most High. But that Al for Alion is to be on, above, upon, and yoked to or joined with. It's the same exact word. But when you're yoked to one, it's one is above and dominated, and the other is trained by it. Just like our Mashiach said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Just in the same pattern there, where he is both above us, but we are joined to him and subservient. That's that word above, right? So when it mentions, like in Genesis, for example, where the darkness was upon or above the deep there, it is yoked to literally connected to it, yoked to it because of the situation, but above at the same time. It gives you a little more meaning for that. But right here, as you can see, when they grow restless, they would rise up in rebellion and they dwell on the fatness of the earth and the dew of the Shamayim, which has meaning in scripture, but it's by the sword that they live which is exactly what Catholicism has done, okay? This is, And Esau hated at Yaakob because of the Baraka with which his father Baruch him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father draw near. Then I am going to kill my brother at Yaakob. And the words of Esau, her older brother, or her older son, rather, 
were reported to Ribka, and she sent and called Yaakov, her younger son, and said to him, See, your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you, to kill you. And now, my son, listen to my voice and rise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days, until your brother's wrath turns away, until your brother's displeasure turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. And I shall send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? And those are the conditions on which we are out of the land and when we return, right? Remember his return and how he appeased his brother. These are all pictures we'll, we'll get to as well. But I'm pointing them out so that you can, if you or anyone listening is familiar with history, the actual events that have happened from the times of our Mashiach until now, and you know these words, then you can start to see the patterns and the actual events that played out in a larger scale, right? If you're not familiar, then a lot of this stuff might be going right over your head. That's okay. Just put it off in the shelf for now and take it for something that you have to get more corroborating witnesses before it's a firm thing in your mind. Don't cast it away, but don't believe it is true if you don't have it proven for yourself. It's very important. You don't just take a man's word for anything. You prove all things and hold fast to that which is tov. You examine the matters that differ to be sincere and not stumbling until the coming of Mashiach, right? We don't act like the ostrich that buries its head in the sand that our creator endowed without Hokma in this life to teach us not to be that way. Okay? It says, And I shall bring or send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you or both in one day? And Rivka said to Yitzach, I am disgusted with my life because of the daughters of Cheth, one of the sects of Cana on there the daughters that Edom or Esau married, if you remember. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what is my life to me? Now, again, we don't have the inside information here, but Jacob told her, look, I'm not going to leave and disrespect my father if, he, if he's in his old age and he's going to see that I took off and he's going to curse me. That's not going to happen unless he sends me himself. And that's why she went to him and said that, and then he sends Yaakov. But again, we'll get to that when we read the book of Yobelim, which is um, like a second witness to these events. So Bereshit, Genesis chapter 28. It says, And Yitzhak called Yaakov, and Baruch, or blessed eth him, and commanded him and said to him, Do not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, which is like Bethel with a wa in it, the house of El, but that's the one it's attached to, right? That's the man on whom it is. And it was from him that the daughters came that were part of the covenant from the house of El just as a type there. But to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take a wife for yourself from there, from the daughters of Laban, which means white, your mother's brother, and El Shaddai Barak eth you, and make you fruitful, and increase you, and you shall become an assembly of peoples, a congregation of peoples. One thing I really want to impress upon all of us is that the words that he speaks, whether it's in his own mouth through the Ruach, which is through the mouth of another man, but what he speaks is with power, and these things are actually done in reality. One of the keys that you can find throughout history tied to his word is the literal names that he uses for individuals happen. So, for example... 
the assemblies of people. We, the people of these United States, came together to form a more perfect union as the literal covenant with our Creator as this assembly. The word for Laos, an Asian Buddhist group, is the Greek word for people that were the Buddhists of the paganized Hebrews that traveled to that area. Budai, which was foretold in Amos, were those that were exiled and separated and ruined or desolated for the things that were happening. And the name they took on as the Buddhists was a literal fulfillment of that fact. But the Laos was the people. We are the people. The word Deutsch, like Deutschland for Germany or Dutch, means of the people. I'm not sure if you knew that. That's literally what it is. And then the laity, which was a romanticized Germanic group. Laity means of the people. All of these groups with that literal name as the assemblies of the people, literally spoken of right here. And just as the Budai or the Buddhists, those that were separated or exiled, were literally foretold in a real thing, so were the lollards or the mumblers and voices from Revelation and the round heads of the crown of 12 stars in Revelation and the woman going off into the wilderness, which was Columbia, who, which was a, deri a, a mocking derision from the British people at that time. Just like the tares of, the Latin, of Latin became the, the lollards of the lollard movement. What was used as mockery by the enemy was literally the name they took for themselves and foretold at that time. But you see this all over the place if you start, if you start paying attention and as you learn. So again, just for the peoples, we the people, both here in Britain, you got the Dutch, Deutschland, all of that means literally of the people. The laity is of the people. The Laos, again, the of the Buddhists from Laos is literally of the people from the Greek derivative. But this is all from this very foretelling being fulfilled. And he says, and I give you, Eth, the beer cat, the beer cat or the blessing of Abraham to you and to, or and your, Eth, or sorry, to you and your seed, Eth, with you, so that you inherit, Eth, the land of your sojournings, which Elohim gave to Abraham. And it, he stamps everything that is his right? I'm sure you can see that. So Yitzhak sent Eth Yaakov away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Ribka, the mother of Yaakov and Esau. And the northern kingdom went to over by the Black and Caspian Sea, over by the Medes and Persians, and spread out from there after their captivity in the 700s BC. And when they were, the good news was brought to them in Armenia, right there north of Haran, you have a place that you can still find called Sakasuna or Saxony, the, the land of the sons of Sac, Yitzhak, if you will, which was one of the names that they picked up along the way. Also foretold that in Yitzhak shall your seed be called. But let's continue. <clears throat> and Esau saw that Yit Yitzhak had Baruch eth Yaakov and sent eth him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that he eth Baruch him and gave him a command saying, do not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Because they were all under the curse for what had happened and all under the ban. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Yitzhak. And Esau went to Yishmael and took Eth Machalath, the daughter of Yishmael, Abraham's son, sister of Neboyoth, who was the leader of the Nebatian tribes of the Arabians, if you will. 
to be his wife besides the wives he had. And Yaakov went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came upon a place and stopped over for the night, for the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and saw a ladder set up on the earth, and its top reached to the Shemaim, and saw messengers of Elohim going up and coming down on it, and see, Yahuwah stood above it. Okay. And said, I am Yahuwah, Elohim of Abraham, your father, and the Elohim of Yitzach, the land on which eth you are lying, eth I give it to you and your seed. That's eth tanach, or eth teneach, right? That's the word there. So I give it to you and your seed, and your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall break forth to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all the clans of the earth shall be Baruch in you and in your seed. And see, I am with you and shall guard you wherever you go and shall bring you back to this land. For I am not going to leave you until I have done at what I have spoken to you. And Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Amen, or truly Yahuwah is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of Elohim. This is the gate of the Shemaim. And Yaakov rose early in the morning, and took Eth the stone that he had put at his head, set Eth it up as a standing column, and poured oil on top of it. So he set it up and made it anointed. Okay. A physical to teach a spiritual. If you'll only pay attention to the parables here. But this rock is something that has been carried on with his children for a very long time. And we actually have two different accountings for it. If you look at the book of Tay Taffy, the Irish bard songs there, they had the lay fell, right? Or the destiny stone that they brought with them, their coronation stone, when she left and was taken to Ireland. And then at the same time, the Caledonians from the ancient history of Caledonia when they left Mitzrayim, the leader from the tribe of Yahuda, he had the stone or the marble chair and the, the Jacob's pillow as his footstool. Now, I don't think that either, I can't say that one account is wrong and the other one is right. I personally believe that it was broken and they had two because you had the line of Zerah, which was sown, and then the line of Ferez, which stayed with them. So, whether or not that's accurate, I can't say for certainty, but you have the facts that both are recorded in history, both have histories with them, and the people had them uh, in their records for what it's worth. But right here it says, And Yaakov made a vow saying, and this one's important, Seeing Elohim is with me and has kept me in this way that I am going and has given me bread to eat and a garment to put on, when I have returned to my father's house in Shalom, and Yahuwah has been my Elohim, then this stone which I have set as a standing column shall be Elohim's house. And of all that you give me, I shall certainly give a tenth to you. And this is where our tithes come from. It was foreshadowed in Abraham giving to Melchizedek, which is our Mashiach beforehand, in which it is even mentioned that Louis tithed in the loins of his father. But later on, this is established and given to Yahuwah through his 
Cohen representative, which is given to the sons of Louis, which happens to be the tenth, the portion for the tenth that was called out here as well in the vow. But um, with that, I think we will have to end for this Shabbat. I hope you all are edified. And if there's any comments or questions for anyone listening to the video, please ask. Leave them in the comments and we'll try to get back to you. If there's anything that you see, any parables in history that you see played out later on, like with the migrations, with the evangelizing and where they went, feel free to share. And um, may you have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a great week ahead. Shavua Tov. Yahuwah be with you.